And some of this stuff might be a little technically dense and I'm trying to cover the, the inner workings of it because once you get to like running the code, you don't need to know any of this, but if you have problems and trying to diagnose why things are don't, not working or you're getting a certain result and what that might mean, it's helpful to at least have a general model or conceptual map as to what the model is trying to accomplish and then like why things might not be working ultimately as to why you choose one method over another method. All right, so back to our presentation here. All right, so I'm gonna move this somewhere out of the way. So what is a state-space model? You might've heard of state-space modeling, um, especially if you have done some stuff previously with animal movements. It's often used for um, dealing with handling animal tracks, analyzing animal tracks, especially for marine animals. Um, I want to show some definitions from different papers that describe state-based models in different ways um, with some diagrams on the right. But uh, one of the earliest papers, if not like the earliest one I'm aware of, in the use of state-based models for animal movement is from Ian Johnson and colleagues in 2003. And defining state-based models as time series models that allow unobservable true states to be inferred from observed data by accounting for errors arising from imprecise observations from, and from stochasticity in the process being studied. Um, this really describes, I think, pretty well the issue of dealing with Argo satellite telemetry. So you have these observations in time that have this, this error associated with them, and you want to be able to account for this error to try to understand the true path or the true pattern or process that this animal's following. Then we have um, from Patterson and colleagues in 2008, it defines uh, state-based models in this review as a time series model that predicts the future state of a system from its previous states probabilistically via a process model. The state-based model describes mathematically how observations of the state of the system are generated via an observation model. So this is discussing a different aspect of this that we can also make predictions based on a state-based model. So um, we have some kind of mechanistic understanding of the underlying process, um, <clears throat> which is described within what's called a process model. Um, so we have this mathematical representation of this process relating the underlying true state process to the observations that we're actually seeing or collecting. Um, in what's called an observation model. So we have these two different models, an observation model and a process model as part of the overall state-space model system. Um, another good paper by Schick and colleagues, um, basically saying that the model can be thought of as two time series running in parallel. So you have a process model running and a observation model, and they're both running in parallel next to each other. And lastly, another review from Ian Johnson and colleagues in 2013, defining state-based models as a stochastic model-based approach that allows mechanistic models of the movement process to be fit directly to telemetry data while accounting for measurement error when appropriate. So especially for error-prone Argos data, we're assuming it's stochastic. So we have this random noise associated with these movements um, that's defining potentially uh, this, this pattern or process that's mechanistically driving this, this movement. So you may have heard of what are called random walks or correlated random walks. They're often used to um, uh, either simulate potential movement patterns or model movement patterns of animals. And then accounting for the error associated with this true process as well as the observations themselves directly. And on the right are the two diagrams showing different kind of parts of this. So the top taken from a review last year by Marie Auger Mate, um, showing the hidden uh, state or process model in the, on those red circles labeled Z sub T minus one or ZT or ZT plus one. And we see the arrows connecting them. This is our uh, process model where each observation is um, 
reliant upon the previous observation and only the previous observation. But then stemming off each of these um, states, essentially these hidden states in red, underneath them there's an arrow in blue or arrow pointing a circle in blue labeled Y. It's Y T minus one, Y T, uh, Y T plus one. So it's showing these are our observations. So this would be part of the observation model. And the observations themselves are only dependent upon the hidden state at that given time. So there's no connection in the observations. We have the connections basically relaying around through this underlying hidden state process. Um, and we see a time series of some variable on the y-axis um, where true observations are shown in these blue dots, these blue points. Um, the true states themselves are shown as red points. And then the estimated state from the state space model is shown in black with a competence region around it. So we see that the estimation from the state space model is able to kind of work around the noise in this time series and match up pretty closely with this true underlying process. And if we think about it um, from a slightly different but similar perspective that labels these a bit more explicitly, I like this figure from uh, Toby Patterson and colleagues on the bottom right, which shows we're also accounting for this hidden behavioral states process labeled S. And this is impacting the hidden true locations labeled Z at the next time. So the state at S T minus one impacts the um, hidden lo true locations for the process model at Z T which then impacts ultimately the observed location at YT. Um, and this is essentially what the state space models are doing that we use to estimate um, behavioral states and account for location error in um, Argo space satellite telemetry. So this is like a nice kind of schematic of what's happening in this process without getting into the math yet. All right, so focusing again on this diagram a little bit more. So the arrows basically connecting this hidden process, the, the process model um, to the observed locations is the observation model. So it's, it's connecting these two different models together or two different states together. And then the process model is kind of everything that's hidden or latent. So it's estimating the behavioral states as well as those true locations. So these are these two different um, parallel models or processes running next to each other. Um, so I'm obviously discussing these in the context of animal movement, animal telemetry, but there is a variety of ways that state-based models have been used in um, a variety of different fields. So obviously animal movement, but then also uh, there's a long history of use in fishery stock assessments. Um, so I think they, They've been used at least maybe a decade before in animal movement in, in fishery stock assessments and are still used. Um, also just general population dynamics. Um, the analysis of capture recapture data in a variety of different contexts, whether it is for population dynamics or estimations of survival, all kinds of other things. Um, even more recently in biodiversity assessments, including things even such as eDNA, you can use uh, state-based models to address biodiversity. Um, but some of its kind of earlier use and still primary use is a lot of times econometrics. So a lot of forecasting done for like modeling stocks and changes in stocks um, is done with some type of state-based models or autoregressive models. Um, but I think the origination supposedly of state-based model use was in some subfield of engineering actually. Um, so there's a variety of different fields that use this type of model, but the, the expertise comes in when you're actually defining mathematically what that process model or observation model look like, because that requires domain specific knowledge. So you need to know that field to come up with a model that accurately describes that process well enough. So what does this look like for animal telemetry? Uh, this. So, uh, it kind of depends. 
um, but there are a variety of different process models that tend to be used and I'll show some of these here below. So there are two different types if you just focus on the time patterns there's discrete time of which there are a handful of different options, including a first difference correlated random walk, meaning that you take the difference in essentially the distance between two locations, two consecutive locations, and then model them following a uh, correlated random walk where an animal may show persistence in the speed and or direction that it's moving. There's also a direct or first difference correlated random walk that includes behavioral state switching, which could be labeled DCRWS. Um, there's also just a basic correlated random walk that includes switching that uses variables other than that difference between locations. And there are hierarchical forms of these above models where you're trying to estimate a population mean for different parameters um, to do some partial pooling or account for these random effects by individual essentially. Then you have continuous time models. So this is basically is able to estimate potentially all the points along an entire path um, at any point you wanted an estimate. Um, so you have things that could be used such as a random walk, which is, is essentially is Brownian motion or random diffusion through space as a velocity model. So instead of looking at positions, you're look, focusing more on the velocity of a movement process. Um, Alternatively, you could also go back to this correlated random walk model, which could be modeled as a ornstein uhlenbeck process um, in a form of velocity model. And these typically require like integrating some function or taking a like, partial derivatives. So there's a lot of underlying and calculus that's required, um, which is why a lot of the times people often didn't use continuous time models. Um, but there are instances where discrete time might be a better approach and others where continuous time might be a better approach. And at this point, both are widely available for use in a relatively simple fashion where you don't need to construct the model yourself. Um, and we see this plot here on the right showing something similar to as before where we have these plus signs indicating the observations that are noisy, the true movement path in red and then the estimated path by the state space model in blue with these confidence intervals around it at different quantiles. Um, and we see this inset plot above showing a time series of the probability of being in a resident behavioral state. So again, in red is the true pattern um, and blue is the estimated pattern. And we see that the, the state space model does a pretty good job of matching up with those. Okay, so making this initial comparison as to these process models, a random walk versus a correlated random walk. Um, so hopefully you've heard of at least these, these types of models before, if you don't even um, know what they are, used some form of them previously, um, but they can be used in all kinds of different ways, but we're using them in a very um, almost literal way to describe the actual movement itself. Um, so random walk is more reflective of, again, a general diffusive process through space. Um, so this type of model could be better used for, for tracks that have these longer time intervals um, where there's limited kind of directional persistence and or autocorrelation in these behaviors. Um, by comparison, a correlated random walk more directly accounts for persistent movements that are often found in animal uh, telemetry data. So it's much better for short time intervals where from one point to the next, they're likely to be doing the same thing. Um, so exhibiting high autocorrelation. And we see on the right side, this figure I've taken from Borger and colleagues, where it shows a few different types of movement processes, um, a random walk or extensions of such. So the top left RW is representing a random walk where it's a relatively diffusive process. There's periods where it's kind of hanging out in one area, but then it kind of shifts or slides a little bit. Um, by comparison next to it, a correlated random walk CRW, where there's periods where it's really tightly clustered and it's not really moving much and then others where it is moving much further. Um, so it is a bit different. And then some of these other models that I won't really 
discuss or we won't be using it all today, but um, there's underneath correlated random walk, BRW is a biased random walk, meaning that there's some area of attraction or repulsion. So in this case, like if you have a central place foraging animal, that's like a seal at a rookery, that it goes out to forage and then comes back or maybe a penguins or something. Um, it's always kind of attracted back to this, this central area. Um, so you might want to model this movement process where it's always kind of drawn back to a given location. Um, and I forget what the, the MCDR, MCRW represents, but it's something similar. Yeah. So that's all very subjective. I think I, I might describe that a little bit later, but in general, I would say if, you're only getting maybe two locations a day, then maybe you can be safe to use a random walk. Part of it also depends on the, the biology of the animal. So if the animal is like moving in more of a diffusive process, then that might mean it's easier to use a random walk and it would match up better versus the correlated random walk. Um, but a lot of times you might need to test both models and see which one works better. But um, it's hard to give like a, a threshold, anything at this below or above is when you should use one. Um, are there so, uh, are there tests for autocorrelation that you can use to determine that with uh, your data? I mean, uh, there's like autocorrelation like functions that you can plot. So if you say, okay, I want to plot, let's say the, the distance, like the step length between consecutive locations and see what the autocorrelation looks like on that. Um, at, like let's say your raw time interval, which might be like an hour. And if there's really high autocorrelation for the first like 10, 20, 30, 40 time lags, then it's like, okay, this definitely probably requires a correlated random walk. Whereas let's say you're only getting one or two observations a day. And like after the first second time lag, it drops to essentially to zero, then it's probably more like a, a random walk. Um, so it kind of depends, yeah, what variables you're analyzing too but you can look at the direct like autocorrelation estimate from like an autocorrelation function. Gotcha. Okay. So now making a comparison between discrete time and continuous time. Um, so discrete time models were implemented, I think at least in animal movement first. So that's why they're more widely used as they were established earlier. And then people saw that those are being used. They just continue to use them. Um, so one example of such is the BSAM package in R, which basically does state-based modeling for Argos tagged animals and uses a Bayesian version of a state-based model. But because of the inner workings of it, um, is super slow and has taken me days to run before. And that doesn't um, assume result in necessarily your model converging successfully. So um, that's a discrete time implementation of a state-based model, but isn't necessarily the best to be used for um, Argo satellite telemetry since those data often are returned as highly irregular time series. Um, so discrete time model breaks up a trajectory into discrete steps, typically at a regular time interval. So let's say your animal is being tagged and it's transmitting every like three hours. If your observations come every three hours, then it makes sense that it naturally fits into this discrete time process. Whereas if you're tagging a marine animal that's air breathing and it comes up to the surface every so often periodically, and maybe there's not always a satellite overhead, um, these are gonna be highly like intermittent and irregular in time. So you might have some observations that are really clustered together and others where they're really spaced out and there might be days between observations. Um, if you couldn't get a good signal with the satellite. Um, so in general, my recommendations are that, yeah, discrete time models are more appropriate for tracks that have a regular time interval. And this tends to be more often the case for terrestrial animals or at least animals that are always in air like seabirds essentially, even if they're like technically marine. And for continuous time models that more naturally handles these observations that are transmitted at irregular time intervals. So almost anything that's tagged in a aquatic or marine environment that uses satellite telemetry 
would highly benefit from a continuous time model instead of a discrete time model. And to kind of show what this might look like, here's a diagram comparing a marine versus terrestrial animal that's been tagged. So at the top, we see a time series of velocity on the y-axis over time on the x. So that's related to this track, this fake track underneath it, and these x's represent the observations. So um, the X is related to the track of the path. Sometimes they're close to the path, sometimes they're pretty far away due to location error. And we see on the plot above the time series, we essentially have like a rug plot on the bottom showing at least the time that it occurred, not necessarily the velocity. And there's some times where they're close together and then there's some large gaps as well. So there's a lot of irregularity in this time series. Whereas if you look on the bottom, we have the time series and the, the track for a terrestrial species. And we see that it's highly regular. So these observations are all spaced out equally. Occasionally they're kind of bunched up or there might be some gaps once in a while, but overall it's highly regular by comparison. Um, so this is showing essentially this dichotomy where in a lot of cases, terrestrial species that are tagged with a GPS tag tend to be much more regular compared to marine animals. So terrestrial organisms would probably benefit more from a discrete time model versus marine organisms that almost always would probably benefit more from a continuous time model by comparison. Okay, so now we're getting into the scary math part and I'm gonna focus on one version of a process model and essentially Everything else we might be using is like built off of this essentially, or it's really similar. So I'm not gonna go into details of every single model, but again, I want you to get a sense of what factors, variables, parameters are driving these estimates. And I'm gonna like label everything. So if you do have any questions or something's confusing, just let me know. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to make it a little less scary. Um, okay, so. Our first variable or parameter here is ZT. So this is the true position of an animal at time T. And again, to define this, just to read the slide, this is defining a first difference correlated random walk. Um, so this is the process model. And then afterwards, after this process model, I'll describe the observation model that it's connected to. So ZT is this variable that I'm using to define the true position. So since it's bolded, that means it's a vector. So this is a vector with two values, one for the x-coordinate, one for the y-coordinate. These could either be in latitude, longitude, these could be in um, a UTM or some other like coordinate projection system that's measured in meters or kilometers, um, but these are your coordinates. Then we have zt minus one. So this is the true position at time t minus one. So this is before time t. So we're using the previous location to help make inferences or estimates on our current location. Then we have this term gamma, and this is representing directional persistence. So this autocorrelation in the speed or the movement pattern of a given animal. Um, so this is like this component that's helping define it as a correlated random walk is because we're including this directional persistence, this gamma term. <clears throat> and then next to it, we have this matrix capital T that's bolded with the parameter theta. So this is the transition matrix of the mean turning angle theta. Um, so the turning angle is this angle between two consecutive uh, steps or movements. Um, and this is helping uh, essentially define this rotational components uh, to this movement process over time. And this is a two by two matrix, so two rows, two columns. Then we get to ZT minus two. So this is again, our true position, but at time T minus two instead. So we're using this, again, this difference, this first difference between T minus one and time T minus two to help estimate our current location ZT. And then lastly is our error term. So epsilon t, and this is the stochastic uncertainty in our true position. So we obviously have the uncertainty in our locations for the observation model, 
but we can also say that there's probably some noise that's impacting our true process that we want to account for. And that's this, this error term at the end here. So now we have our definitions for each of these variables within the process model at large. But now we'll go ahead and break down these, these terms a little bit further. So again, ZT, we have these two um, values essentially within this column vector. So we have the true longitude and the true latitude or other form of coordinates that you're using. And then we're defining T. In this case, this is a discrete time model. So we have a regular time step T and this is greater than or equal to one. So that'd be time T one, that's our first observation all the way up to the maximum time step capital T. That's how we would index these different locations. And then we have um, our term gamma. So this is anything between or equal to zero or one. And this is essentially like a correlation term. That's how you could think of it. So if gamma is equal or close to one, there's essentially no correlation with the previous movement or the previous step. Whereas if it's equal to or close to one, there's a very strong correlation with the previous step. So that's how you could think of this, this parameter, this variable. Then our transition matrix T theta, Again, theta is our mean turning angle, so the average turning angle. And we have this matrix of different trig functions, essentially. So we have on the diagonal, the primary diagonal, we have cosine of theta. And then on the off diagonal, we have sine of theta and minus sine of theta. And again, this is what's controlling that potential rotation of the movement path within the correlated random walk model. Um, so that's what's letting it move around a bit. And then for our error term, epsilon t, we're assuming this comes from a bivariate normal distribution, which I'm um, indicating by this capital N with a subscript 2. And we assume that it's a vector with mean 0 here for the mean. So because there's two dimensions, we have a mean value that's a vector. And we're assuming both values, both means are 0. And then instead of the normal standard deviation or variance term, if it's a multi-dimensional normal, multivariate normal, then we have a variance covariance matrix that defines that. So this variance covariance matrix, sigma, is defining the, the standard deviation or the variance in each of these coordinates, each of these dimensions. So on the primary diagonal, we have um, the variance in the longitude and then the variance in the latitude. And then on the off diagonal, we have the covariance in the longitude and latitude. So we have this correlation term, rho, and then the standard deviation in longitude, standard deviation in latitude. Um, so essentially all you need the model to estimate is sigma longitude or sigma squared longitude and sigma squared latitude. Once you have those, you can estimate the rest of these terms. Um, let me check the chat really quick. Okay. All right, so that was the process model defining the underlying hidden movement process. Um, and now we have our observation models. This is what's connecting these true states, these true locations to what we observed in the track. So Y sub I, again, it's bolded because it's a vector. This is our observed position at time I. And notice that we're using I as a subscript instead of T for the observed positions or observed locations. And that's because we don't always observe the locations at the same time, yeah, the same time, exact time as our underlying process. So we need to be able to account for and shift um, these positions to match up together. And I'll kind of be defining this within this observation model. So we have these variable, this variable j sub i. And this is the proportion of the regular time interval between t minus 1 and t. So this is what's accounting for this difference between the observed versus the true positions and what their times are. So typically for a model like this, you need to define what your time step is. 
So it's going to choose a regular time step. Let's say it's four hours. And let's say that your observed time is like an hour off from this time interval at one point in time. Um, you want to have that matched up. So essentially you're going to do linear interpolation to estimate the potential location of where that would have been was it actually matched up with that hidden process. Um, so we're using one minus J sub I related to this true position at time T minus one. So this is coming from that uh, process model, the true position. Um, and then again, relating that proportion of the regular time interval directly to the true position at time T. So it's trying to find this middle ground between the previous true position and the current true position and relating that time series in true time versus observed time, which I know is probably a little confusing. Um, and then at the end, we have our error term again, but for the observation model, and this is labeled eta sub i. And um, this is also bolded, although it doesn't look super bold. Um, and this is the uncertainty in the observed position. And this is where we get to account for our location errors that it's reported back to us from Argos. So related to the different location classes or maybe the actual like error radius or ellipse size itself um, is accounted for in this term. So to break these down, Y sub I similar to Z sub T is again a two value vector, column vector for our observed coordinates, longitude, latitude. Then I is equal, greater than or equal to uh, one as our first observed time step or N, which is the maximum number of observations. So again, this is slightly different from the previous slide where we used T to represent time. T is not gonna be necessarily equal to I at each of these steps. And then defining our error. So we have error term or variable eta sub i, and this is coming from a bivariate t distribution. So some previous, I think early iterations used a bivariate normal again, but the upside to using a t distribution or bivariate t here is that the t distribution has fatter tails than a Gaussian or a normal distribution, which means that it attributes a greater probability to observing larger errors. And since Argos tracks typically have large errors, um, it kind of has a, a greater likelihood, I guess, if you were to compare them uh, to matching up with this true error process. Um, so a bivariate T distribution is used here, which is centered on zero. And then we have uh, a few different variables or parameters here defining this distribution. Um, so kind of this scaling variable we have as a product between this correction factor psi, capital psi that's bolded, and then um, we're taking what's called the Hadamard product. So it's like an element wise product between that and this scale, <coughs> sorry, this scale parameter capital S. And that's sub i, that's because we have a different value per time i. And then we also need to define our degrees of freedom, capital D sub i. So the scale parameter, S sub i, we have a different scale parameter for longitude and latitude. And then attributed with these is another um, subscript labeled Q sub i. And Q sub i is related to each Argos location class. So there's a difference scaling parameter per Argos class, location class for longitude and a different one per latitude. So in general, there'd be um, 12 total scaling parameters here. So you'd have six for longitude, six for latitude related to three, two, one, zero, A and B location classes. Um, and that's just for the scaling parameter S sub I, and this is done for each observation I. And then for the term psi, we only have a single value for longitude and single value for latitude. And this helps slightly modify these, these scaling parameters. So it's a correction factor in the longitude and in the latitude over all times i. And then our matrix or vector D 
representing the degrees of freedom. And this represents the degrees of freedom um, for each, again, each location class for longitude and then also for latitude. So there's 12 terms that would potentially need to be estimated here, but in order to kind of get around or circumvent the issue of needing to estimate all of these different parameters, um, a lot of times these are fixed based on empirical studies. So you don't need to worry about the model estimating a ton of different parameters in addition to the ones you really care about. Okay, so that's the bulk of the math for this presentation. Hopefully it wasn't too terrible. Um, we'll come back to a little bit more in a second, but it just builds off what we've already done. Um, so kind of exemplifying this first difference correlated random walk, we have this, uh, this figure from uh, Ajay Mate and colleagues from 2021 showing a first difference correlated random walk fitted to a polar bear track. So we see on the left, the track itself, and these points on the, the map are color coded by Argos class. So for the observations, it goes from dark, like blue, which is a three, so that's the best, all the way up to B, which is the worst, and that's like a aqua teal color, um, turquoise. And then in red is the estimated state to the estimated position from the state space model. And the true positions determined by GPS with much smaller location errors, that's like 30 meters compared to like 250 meters for the best for Argos um, are these open circles. So if we zoom in on um, these parts of the track that's shown in the shaded gray region on the right side, if we look at the time series for longitude and latitude, in general, um, this, this estimated path from the state-space model matches up pretty well with uh, locations that are of higher quality from Argos, and they match up pretty well with those GPS locations as well. But uh, you see that anything that's labeled A or B tends to be spread out a bit more from that track path. Same goes for latitude. And if we look at the whole path for this figure subplot A, we see all these kind of noisy points that are typically A or B. And we can't even really see anything that's one or higher for the Argos location classes because they're all under the estimated true path or the estimated path on the state space model. Um, so it appears it's doing a pretty good job. Um, okay, so another example, this is a simulated example from um, Toby Patterson and colleagues from a few years ago. So they simulated a, uh, a path or movement path and then have um, the noisy observations that they generated from it and then the estimation from the, the state space model. So the, the observations with noise are in gray, the true path is in blue, and the estimated path in the state space model is in black. And we see that despite all the noise from the observations, the state space model estimated path matches up relatively well to this true simulated path. And we can see these comparisons um, for the X and Y coordinates on the bottom over time, um, it seemed to do a really good job. So again, just showing how the state space model is accounting for these location errors. All right, again, I mentioned there'd be a little bit more math. So now we're going to show how we're gonna incorporate the behavioral aspect to this. So that's that model is only for accounting for location error, specifically for Argos based tags. Um, but the focus is workshops on behavioral state estimation. So we want to use this model to also simultaneously estimate behavioral states. And this is nearly identical to a first difference correlated random walk, but you add a term essentially and add some nuance. So this is the process model again, but there's a slight difference. So the, the labels I've highlighted in red are the ones that we're slightly modifying here. Everything else stays the same. So you'll notice that the subscripts that we actually now have subscripts for gamma and for the transition matrix T with theta. And that's showing um, the subscript B T minus one. So B is indicating our behavioral states and then at time T minus one here. Um, so that means that we're gonna have a different parameter, a different term 
for each behavioral state that's being estimated for directional persistence, but then also for this transition matrix, the turning of this, this path. So again, kind of relating back to this diagram, we're using the behavioral state at T minus one to estimate the true position of our current state ZT. So to kind of tie these back in together, together in this conceptual model. And the way we can kind of do this is we're assuming, we're gonna say that the probability, so PR, that behavior B at time T is equal to I, I being a behavioral state is um, given, so that vertical bar, given B T minus one, so the behavior at time T minus one is equal to J. So I and J are just stand-ins for some behavior. Um, so the label says probability being in behavioral state I for time T. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, for, for state space models in general, we're gonna assume that there's two different behaviors that are occurring. So I and J can both be one or two. Um, so I could be equal to one. And we're gonna say, what's the probability of being in state one given you were in state one at the last time or changing behaviors um, so there's a few different possibilities that could occur for specifically. So we're saying that that's equal to this parameter variable alpha ij, and that's essentially an element representing some um, part of this matrix alpha. So on this primary diagonal, the we have the probability of either being in staying in state one, so being in alpha. Uh, being in state one, given that you were previously in state one, or on the bottom right, being in state two, given that you were in state two previously. And then we have these switches that's on the off diagonal. So in the first row, this is representing the probability of changing to state one, given that you were in state two. And then vice versa on the bottom left, we have probability of changing from state one to state two. So anytime you see the, the subscripts here, the first number is gonna be what it's switching into. And on the right is what it's switching from. Um, and this is essentially what's defining the likelihood of being in one state given you were previously in a different state or some state. So this is like the wrinkle to adding behavior to this model. It's not a lot, but it's enough to make this different and be able to capture this behavioral pattern. Um, so that does it for these discrete, discrete time models in general, um, which I won't actually be using any for this presentation today, um, but they are very common. It's easier to describe than a bunch of the different equations or uh, calculus involved for some of these continuous time models. Um, so I won't be going into the details of the continuous time models since we're also limited on how much time we have. But um, essentially, it, it operates in a similar way, but the focus is instead on velocity and its relationship to the locations instead of just these difference between locations. Um, and is able to uh, also account for this temporal autocorrelation in this velocity process. And there's a large number of different ways to fit state-space models. Um, so in general, the breakdown, we can look at this. There's different ways to fit it within a frequentist framework or a Bayesian framework. Um, so different <coughs> frequentist frameworks that you could use include maximum likelihood estimation, MLE, uh, Laplace approximation. Um, there's other types, so like particle filtering, I often hear of related to Bayesian modeling, but it's not labeled so in this table. Um, if you're using a Bayesian framework, there's different types of algorithms for Markov chain Monte Carlo that you can use. So there's Metropolis Hastings, which is used for that BSAM model, which uses JAGS. Then there's Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is a bit faster, which is used in STAN typically, and then other methods. Um, so again, BSAM primarily uses this Metropolis Hastings algorithm, but what we're gonna be using today in the foie gras package is gonna use Laplace approximation using TMB or template model builder. <clears throat> so because it is using maximum like, or not maximum likelihood estimation, but like a frequentist framework, 
um, it's going to go a lot faster than BSAM would, where it's going to take forever to run um, using Jags with a whole Monte, Monte Carlo chain. All right, and kind of getting to the end of this presentation is focusing on some motivating examples. So what can you kind of do with these models, essentially? Um, and some of these require more than just using a basic package, just as it is. So there was this paper from Schick and colleagues in 2013, actually estimating the body condition or the body fats in, I forget what type of seal, some spe seal species off California based on the drift rate. So you'll see the drift rate, drift rate color coded on the map, but then also the time series on the bottom. Um, and we see the number of drifts is related to the size of the circle. So the higher the drift rates, um, presumably the, the lower adipose tissue, the lower fat contents compared to uh, slower drift rates, which would have less or would have more fat, which would keep them more buoyant. Um, so they're inferring body fat composition from like a, a drift rate, so like a diving pattern in seals, which is really cool. And that's using state-based models. Um, additionally, there's this uh, paper from Ian Johnson from 2019 that's focusing on um, a different type of behavioral state estimation from what's done in BSAM, which instead treats the behavioral state process here, gamma, um, as more of a continuum of behaviors instead of either being one behavior or another. Um, so we see that anything that's more yellow or closer to a value of one um, means that it's moving more quickly in a more directed fashion. And anything that's closer to zero, anything that's more of like a blue, um, it's moving more slowly. Maybe it's more tortuous in its movements. Um, so we can see these seals, ele southern elephant seals leaving um, the island of Craigwellen and going south to Antarctica to go forage before coming back to the island. And then um, another way you could potentially use state-based models, this is actually a preliminary figure from some work I'm currently doing on green turtles in the Gulf of Mexico, um, but you can use them in other ways to account for location error. So besides accounting for the, uh, trying to estimate the true location that they were found from this Argos uncertainty, um, you also typically don't know where the animal has been between those observations. Um, so the assumption typically is that it moves linearly, it's a straight line, but obviously we know that isn't necessarily the case. It can go anywhere in between them, but typically something that's closer to a straight line is more possible as that time interval shortens. If it's a really long gap in time between observations, there's more possibilities for locations they could have gone given the expected movement speed. Um, so there's something called uh, multiple imputation or process imputation where you generate multiple realizations of a track. So it assumes essentially that the like, positions that they were observed are, are fixed, but it like um, estimates or imputes these locations that could have been in between these observations. So we see that, it, I guess it's kind of hard to see on this, this projection, um, but we see multiple paths per actual individual. So in this case, I'm creating 20, simulator to 20 imputations for each turtle to account for some of this error that might be occurring um, along these movement paths. All right, so that does it for the presentation component of state-based modeling. Um, again, I know some parts of it are kind of dense, so you don't necessarily need to remember everything, but hopefully it at least gives you some insight as to what things are working and what you're looking at when we're um, going through some of these different parameters and values when inspecting the model results.